All right. This next young lady I'm about to bring to the stage, I actually just met this year, maybe? Maybe last year, end of last year. Um, great hip hop artist. I'll just start with that. She is great. You know, she can freestyle all that. But tonight, that's not what this is about. And I told her, her brand is beyond hip hop. Her, bronze, her brand is beyond hip hop. She's going to lead us into the way. She's a woman, which is an awesome thing. I'll call her intellectual, even though, eh, sometimes a dirty word, but no. <laughs> she's an intellectual. She's a grad student. So she's going to give y'all a little something what, she do, what she's been dealing with and what she can present to y'all. So y'all give it up for a comrade of mine, a friend of mine. Y'all give it up for Mariah Parker. Hi, everybody. Well, first of all, I want to thank Montu for putting all this together and for everybody who came out tonight. Um, like he said, I, I do a little hip-hop. I'm used to a very different crowd than this one. But um, <laughs> like he said tonight, um, I'm here to talk to you a little bit about what I do in the linguistics program. And particularly, I'm here to talk to you about the possibility of a linguistic revolution. Tonight, we've talked about um, reframing um, the rebellion of Nat Turner in various ways and taking it out of the hands of people who have tried to cast him as a villain. And I think that it's a struggle we're still going through today. And I'd like to talk to you about how we can reframe the way that we see ourselves and the way society sees us by using language. So we've all heard the phrase, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. And when we think about modern day rebellion and revolution, I think the same phrase applies, which probably sounds crazy, but here's what I mean. In order to organize effective rebellion, we need to recognize which systems are broken and which aren't, and utilize the stable systems as tools to take apart the faulty ones and build better ones in their place. Take, for example, African American language, what linguists call African American English, or AAE. Now, African American English is the most studied language variety in the world. That's right, in the whole entire world. In almost 50 years of studying it, linguists have come to realize and to argue to the rest of the world an important fact. African American English is not broken. It, in fact, it is as rule-governed and coherent as the English people speak in the halls of Harvard or behind the desk at CNN. And if you don't believe me, let's do a quick little linguistic experiment. So I'm going to read you five short sentences. And I want people in the room here who feel they probably speak African American English to tell me which ones don't fit. So he telling the truth, she telling the truth, we telling the truth, they telling the truth, I telling the truth. Can anyone pick out the faker? I telling the truth. So, it might be hard to recognize at first glance, since all of our lives we've been led to believe that these are all incorrect by school teachers who don't appreciate the rules of African American language. But if you really probe your intuition, you can see that nobody in the right mind would say, I tell them the truth, <laughs> non-jokingly. It's a rule of AAE. It's not random, it's a part of the grammar. AAE abounds with such rules, and we know these rules as speakers of African American English, even if we can't always explain what or why these rules are. Now, you might be wondering, why does any of this matter? But remember the old phrase, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. It matters because it's not black English that's broken, it's language ideology that wages war against black ways of being, and that's what's broken and needs fixing. It matters because one type of revolution available to us is a psychological one. It hinges upon us overturning our views of ourselves and realizing our language is not deficient, but in fact, the site of linguistic innovation. So much that today, everyone in popular culture uses its tricks to be stylish and relevant. Mm -hmm. That's right. Mm -hmm. Not only is it not broken, it's a cultural gem that everyone from white male adolescents to Taylor Swift wants a piece of. In some of my research as a linguist, I work to show the undercover power that African American language holds in society. I explore the ways that non-black people use the features of African American English, say things like he tripping or that's dope or he telling the truth, to negotiate power within our communities and the mainstream community at large. 
I look at white rappers like Rob Sonic or Lil Dicky, who without their deft use of black communication features, when rapping, would probably get laughed out the game. I consider white teenage boys who find in hip hop a kind of masculinity that's absent in the suburbs and study how they use black language to flaunt masculinity. I do this so that I can say to black children, look, your teacher may have told you you're saying it wrong, but look at how many people want to sound just like you. And I do this because I believe redefining our language as powerful and appreciating the power our language holds is critical in overturning what society would like us to believe about ourselves. But overturning what we believe about ourselves and our language is just a start. Even after 50 years of research, which confirms that African American English is as grammar bound as the Queen of England's, we still see a widespread failure for teachers to appreciate the rule governed nature of this beautiful dialect. People not only dismiss its grammar, but also its social practices and its cultural values. And misunderstanding these practices is a big deal because to the uninitiated and afraid, black language may echo the codes and spirituals that enslaved Africans used to make their secret plans in Nat Turner's era. To the uninitiated and afraid, it's easy to say, if it doesn't make sense to me, it must be an attack against me. If it doesn't make sense to me, it must be an attack against me. Consider the black art of indirection, studied for decades like schol by scholars like Geneva Smitherman and Marceliana Morgan. We find it in signifying the art of making a point through use of sneaky metaphor. We find it in rap music, whose lyrical density calls its listeners to unpack the content over many listens and slowly discover its secret meanings. As linguist and educator Terry Meyer once put it, within the African American speech community, verbal facility is measured not by the ability to make one's point clear, but by the ability to make one's point in a clever or unusual way, and with such skill that the point does not require explicit statement. Generally harmless, and in fact ingenious at times, indirection is one of the great cultural values of black language. However, to the uninitiated and afraid, to those who don't understand that these moves and games are just part of the culture and fear legitimizing them. Indirection can be mistaken for disrespect. And in the classroom where, in most parts of this country still, uninitiated white teachers hold the power, indirection can land students in the principal's office, in detention, or worse. It's easy to say, if it doesn't make sense to me, it must be attack against me, and in turn, to strike down a rebellion that ain't even really happening. <laughs> Could this failure to appreciate black language be a part of why black students are disproportionately disciplined by the American education system? Consider, for example, that black students are three and a half times as likely to be suspended or expelled than their white peers, for example. The issue is obviously complex, and language can't be the only reason. Still, in the words of Secretary of Education Arn Dunn, education is the civil rights movement of our era. Ours is an era where black men and women live in fear of having their lives taken even when they aren't dissenting. Thus, in place of demonstrating or going on that turner and killing a bunch of people, <laughs> educating has become an increasingly radical act and our way of stealthily overturning the current social order. I believe that if we push back against education systems that belittle and penalize black communication, well, we'll be on our way to fixing some of our problems. So I see linguistic revolution as threefold. It starts with educating ourselves, knowing what our language is worth and becoming aware of the power it holds in society. It ain't broke and there's no need to fix it. Second, it comes with educating others. Next time someone tries to tell you that Ebonics is broken, point them to the literal thousands of pages of scholarship which squashes this view. Have them hit me up and I personally will set them straight. <laughs> Yay! 
Beyond that, we need to push educators to understand and appreciate African American English, the social practices and the cultural values that come with it, to stop punishing children for their black ways of speaking and being, and in doing so, keeping them mentally enslaved. In these moves, I think we can find freedom. Thank you. I told y'all, we're gonna bring y'all a little bit of everything tonight. Linguist student, professor, poets, hip hop. We have everything in our community. So I'm about to bring up this next brother. He's been doing, he's been doing some good things in the poetry scene. He's got a book out. He just hit me up about doing a CD. So it's all coming. And I just want y'all to support everything that we do, not just because blindly supporting it. I want you to support it because it's the right thing to do. We have a lot of good things going on in Athens. Just continue to support the things that we're doing. So without further ado, I'm about to bring up this brother. Been doing some good things. Not even been, been doing poetry that long but really been doing poetry that long. Y'all give it up for my comrade, my brother. Y'all give it up for Shed. I was a born leader, a teacher preacher from the start. I shared from the Bible what I was taught, so charge it to my mind and not my heart. My teachings aided to the mental captivity of my people, and coming from the Bible and I is what made it believable. Through my teachings, I justified the state that we were living in, bred to labor as master's property, punishment for being born with dark skin. But then one day a voice came down from heaven's way, one I've been yearning to hear for so long. It said, my child, my son, my faithful servant, it's time you sing a new song. Mm -hmm. So I examined myself and my brethren and started to take inventory. I looked at where our lives were headed and thought about our past story. I saw that physically there's more of me than there is of him. And numerically, there are more of us than there are of them. Rebel was the song he gave me, and I sung it to my dying second. Rebel is what he told me. Rebel with my blessings. And today in 2016, I sang my song to you. Rebel until your job no longer operates with favoritism. Rebel until society advances from hearing you and start to listen. Rebel until you deprogram your way of thinking. Rebel so your little ones will have a chance at living. Rebel until these major corporations start to give back to your community. Rebel together and wake up and realize the power in numbers when standing in unity. Thank you. He's got a book out right now. Where can they get your book? It's in the Abbott Bookshop and on Sheer Performance Hair Salon. Shedrick Barnett. Y'all look up his book and y'all y'all support 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 us, man. All of us. You know everything that we're doing in the community, whether they're a, a, an author, a program, an educator, a linguist, whoever you are, let's just all support each other. Can we do that? Yeah. All right. This next young brother I'm about to bring to the stage is he needs and wants some support and been doing some great things in the community. I've seen him substitute teach. I've seen him uh, on the, the wrestling mat helping somebody who got hurt. I've seen him uh, just out in the community shaking hands. I've seen him serving food. I've seen this brother literally doing everything. Wears many hats. Visual artist, phenomenal. So y'all give it up for one of my comrades, one of my brothers. Y'all give it up for Broderick Flanagan. As, um, thank you, Montu, for the introduction. Um, as he stated before, I am uh, Broderick Flanagan and I do wear many hats, um, ranging from artist, entrepreneur, um, community organizer, uh, father, son, mentor. Um, 
Today I stand before you to share with you some of my thoughts and humble opinions in uh, I have a little technical difficulties. Here we go. Okay. Uh, there we go. All right, share some of my thoughts and humble opinions with you in regards to the question why was there a need for a rebellion? An artist's perspective. I do not consider myself a historian, so I'm not able to recite every detailed account that led to the condition of the black man in our society today. I also come before you recognizing that I am an eternal being and reaffirming that I am neither a second-class citizen nor a subhuman. With that being said, the very language and the nature of the Declaration of Independence that was written by one of our founding fathers states that we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. Uh, bearing this in mind, at this point, during the birthing of this nation, the Founding Fathers had an opportunity to make good on their promise for a true democracy. As stated by a professor at Delaware State University, and I quote, the Founding Fathers had the moral authority and the political opportunity to materialize true democracy all they had to do was self-apply the ideals they self-professed, end quote. As history shows, this did not happen. Instead, our founding fathers chose to keep their moral compasses in their pockets when it came to applying these values to black lives. So it was interwoven into the foundations of this nation that black lives were excluded from such liberties. Various examples in history include slave codes, black codes, pig laws, Jim Crow segregation laws, redlining, and various others. In retrospect, as I thought about the topic, why was there a need for a rebellion, outside of the obvious that blacks were, were literally and physically enslaved, lynched, and killed, it actually began to raise more questions than answers. It is said by a few in the art world that some of the best art raises more questions. So I want to share with you some of the questions that came up for me as I thought about this. One of those questions include, what does it really mean to be free? And does it come with a price? If you think about it, we are, we are the only group of beings on this beautiful place that we call Earth that pays to live here. And how long are we going to allow profits to overrule basic human rights? Come on. As, as we know, the actual the people that rebelled and stood up against the, the dominant society were once viewed as a resource, human capital. And I think uh, some people kind of miss the actual, what the actual formation of race or racism was intended to do. It was about the control of resources. And at one point, those resources were actually human beings. The next question I want to ask, does a flower or a tree need to, remind it, need to be reminded that it is free to grow? Today, we are free as black people we are allowed to come and go and have the experiences as we so choose. And lastly, before I start talking about my art piece, I want to ask, what are you willing to do to experience that growth? <clears throat> so this piece I did is a piece I did called Remembering, and I actually did it about two years ago. Um, so that was back in 2014. Um, I guess a little background on myself as a visual artist. I, I did not go to art school. Um, I'm mostly self-taught. I took a few art classes in high school. Um, but I didn't really become a painter until later in life. 
And um, actually, art was not even my first chosen career. As Montu mentioned earlier, I wore many hats. <laughs> but um, to give you a little bit of background on, on my perspective, as um, I, did, I was thinking about this painting, uh, but most of the time, when I'm showing my work, I, I like to allow the viewer to interact with it and form their own personal uh, perceptions and, and views. But oftentimes, I do get asked about my work sometimes. And um, this is one of those times when I get to share my insights into my creative process. Um, as someone mentioned earlier, this painting kind of explains the trajectory of the black man, so to speak. Or if you want to take it, make it on a more personal level, it kind of is a reflection of, of me being an eternal being and the trajectory that you would take across many lifetimes. Um, and to further explain or elaborate, over here, can you guys still hear me? Yeah. All right. So over here, you have the figure or the caricature uh, represented with the crown. And this would be uh, the African in his environment. And then, as we are taught mostly here in public schools in America, that uh, black history as it pertains to this, this country started with slavery. But as we all know, we had a rich culture that, that expands far beyond that. Mm -hmm. And that's a beautiful, rich culture. So right here, we have the kind of introduction to uh, the colonization, where the, guy, the, the subject is taking off his crown and he's trying on a hat. So this kind of represents the invasion of the Europeans into Africa. And a little known um, discussion is around the resistance that took place during this transition. There were many wars that were fought on the continent of Africa when the Europeans were trying to colonize that really doesn't get talked about a lot in history. Now, this uh, next transition right here, the guy's kneeling down and he's uh, feeling kind of defeated and he has his crown in his hand still, but he's kind of thinking about what's gonna happen next. And then if you move to the next picture in the middle, you see he is kneeling down, then captured as his crown right here on the ground. Yep. And then to come over here on this side, this kind of represents that middle passage that Dr. Bab was talking about. And, and when we came over here to this country, we were forced into slave labor. There's free labor for us. And then the transition into the man standing up and started to realize that this was not my purpose here. I was put here to do more than just be in this position. Mm -hmm. All right, and then next you transition into the guy standing up, he still has a tool in his hand, so this still is slavery, but he also has a book in his hand. All right. So he's beginning to educate himself. And, and that's very key, that's very important because um, I believe in some of the writings of Frederick Douglass, he said, once a man becomes educated, he's no longer fit to be a slave. Yeah. 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 So that's kind of what this caricature right here represents. And then lastly, you can see the guy over here, he's taking off the hat, you know, and scratching his head. Like, where do we go from here? So what's next? So... And you can also see kind of the trajectory of the size of the beings. I don't know if you uh, kind of caught that when you're looking at the picture. But over here, he's standing tall, he's big, and it's slowly shrinking down, shrinking down. And then it comes back up right here. Yeah. So that kind of explains my perspective and my thoughts that went into this painting right here. Um, I want to leave you with this thought right here, though. Um, at this current time in society, we have opportunity to, to really dictate the future uh, of this nation and this local community. Um, as Matu was saying, we need to start to come together. And I feel like we need to become organized, everyone, around social issues and justices that are happening in our community. And I believe we can really start to, to grow and work towards that democracy that our founding fathers we're fighting for for themselves. Spread love.
He's got local business. He's got a uh, like an art shop over on the east side in the Triangle. It's amazing. Please go and support it. Um, you know, buy some art. Go to an art class. Just support it, or just even if you just tell somebody about it. That's all we're trying to do right here. Okay. Art show coming up too, uh, September twenty second. Sorry, I forgot to mention. <laughs> hey, because you you know what's crazy about us? We we. We do this so much for the community, sometimes we forget to plug the things that we do. Because we, we feel like, I don't want to get up here and like, I feel like I'm plugging for the things that I do. No. Like, support him. Like, he don't want to shamelessly plug, but we have to be able to do that. Because he don't want to do it because he feels like, I don't want to just because I, I'm using this crowd. Like, we really honestly feel that way. Sometimes we don't want to use the crowd. You know? But... You're here, so we need to tell y'all what the hell going on, man. Amen. Come on. All right. So um, next up, I had a couple things going on, but we figured that the next person I'm about to bring up would fit perfectly right after Broderick. So this guy I'm about to bring up to the stage is actually like the last four years have been one of my mentors, and he's had some... We have had some really good conversations. And he's been really strong arm. Like, he's the one dude that, like, he tells me straight up. Like, a lot of people talk to me, but he'll talk to me straight up. Like, two. Like, you need to dun, 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 dun. go back to school, forget everything else. I need you in a classroom. Like, this is my mentor. I'm his mentee. So, y'all give it up and please give mad respect to. This is Montour's mentor. Y'all give it up for Professor Real. Is, is, where's Van at? Because I'm not sure exactly which one of these is his. Is Van somewhere around? Oh, yeah. Which one of these are, is his? Good evening, everyone. I'll just talk while Montour is, is, is setting this up. I may be the only person in the room tonight that, that may work as hard as Montu. So Montu has about three or four it? jobs. I've been up since about four this morning myself. So this is, and this is the third time I've been teaching today. But uh, I generally come here to learn. You know, I'm an, I'm an old English major, and I come and I bring my pen and uh, my paper, and I'm, and I'm here learning. And I'd like to thank Montu. For, for, for doing and his, uh, you know, what he says about boots on the ground, getting it done. A man who works all night. I do. You know, works all night and then makes the time to come in and do things for the, uh, for the community. And if we could just kind of, you know, set aside what, what I'm going to briefly talk about for a little bit and just, you know, give him, give him a pound, some applause. For everything that he's Just, just put it on like view or whatever. I was, uh, I, I was in class this morning and I want to start out by saying that reading, and I'm not a reader, even though I'm, I'm an English major, reading though saved my life. Okay? Reading saved my life. And I had an experience in the classroom uh, th this afternoon actually, and uh, I'm, I'm working uh, this year teaching freshman English in Greene County. And, uh, you know, they, there's some challenging stuff, uh, some really low uh, reading scores and, and things like that. And I'm just trying to get the students to buy into the importance of education, the importance of reading, and not seeing that as something that is, um, or not buying into this, this, this sense of anti-intellectualism and, and what that means. And in the classroom, as students who are terrified of reading aloud, terrified of text, who can so beautifully and brilliantly freestyle and do amazing things with language, and to not understand that the way in which they uh, deconstruct music, the way in which they deconstruct 
um, experiences, how that is very much like uh, reading Shakespeare and those types of things. So, and, and, and the experience that I had today where a student, I had, it, it had taken me two weeks to get her where she would read, and I tried to create a, a culture of um, a, a, com a comfortable classroom, a culture where it's okay to fail, we want you to try, we want you to grow, and in the process of doing that, students began laughing and snickering and teasing her. And, and I could just see, as she was excited, then to see her spirit just, just sink. And that is a failure of the community. That is not only on me, right? That is on all of us. Uh, as, as a want to be, hope to be intellectual, who began reading to his children when they were in the womb. You know, that was the, that's how important I saw reading. And to see uh, this circle that we have where parents are not initiating their children and teaching them the importance of reading. Okay? Because we can't learn the beauty of our language if we don't read the books and what the scholars talk about. Okay? So we can't learn the other perspectives of this, this brave, valiant hero, right? If we allow other people to tell our stories. And, and that's what happened with Nat Turner, right? Other people are telling the stories of the experience. And then we go back to this idea and this concept of truth. There is no truth. Kierkegaard tells us that truth is the reality of your own experience. And if you are the one in power, then you are then the creator of truth, if such a thing does exist. Okay. So we need to step back and look at a bigger picture. So I don't, I don't have answers. I don't believe in answers. I just believe what, what I have in, in my PowerPoint. And I, I like this background. This is, I'm going to take this and call it mine. Right? <laughs> that's, what, that's what English majors do. We, we just borrow from everybody and say, you know, I got this idea. So I just... Next one. Oh, man, I'm going to mess it up. The mouth. The mouth. The mouth. All right. There you go. I'm feeling it. Ah, here we go. Here we go. Okay. Point of view. Okay, point of view. And that, that becomes a, an important thing to talk about. And, and now it's becoming this, you know, prof, professorial lecture thing. And I'm going to bore everybody with the slides. But, you know, you, know, you, you paid your admittance, you know. So now I got you now. Close the door. Close the door. Okay. The way in which we interpret things, okay, we all have different realities. Okay, the way in which I live in the world, the way in which I come to be in the world, dictates the way I understand the world. Okay, so when one is in power, and, and I forget, I, I believe the, um, you know, this young sister was making this excellent point about this fear of if we don't do things my way, then there's an issue and there's only one way to do things. You know? And then we begin to label things and talk about languages the, as it is possible for language to be good or bad, right or wrong. Okay? And I've been speaking, you know, the first language I ever learned was the black vernacular. Okay? And I tell children... My students, in day one, okay, I will never say that you are speaking incorrectly. What I am here to do, my job, is to teach you that you are bilingual. Yeah. That you need to be... That you need to be bilingual and bicultural. And then that empowers you to when you are an adult, you may choose to go into the world of business, or not. College may not be the right choice for you, but it's my job to make you read this stuff that you don't want to read, because if you change your mind in three or four years, okay, you don't want to start getting your education when you have to have a family to support. Okay. So as teachers, we have to introduce our students, our, our babies, to the importance of Lifelong learning. Yes. Yes. Lifelong learning. So I'm coming from the perspective of point of view, and this is a collection of 
many of my lectures over the year for African American studies about how we would, you know, how we build up to getting to Nat Turner and uh, this culture or this, this experience of resistance and why there is this need to resist. So, kind of, this is, and again, this is welcome inside my head. This is inside my head. This is what I'm thinking. And I'm an English major again. Outlines. I gotta have outlines. I can't do anything without outlines. Okay. So, all right, let's start by saying it's complicated. It's complicated. Right? Okay? Because, and, and again, my update. Slavery, okay? Did slavery exist in Africa? Absolutely. Slavery is as old as people getting tired of burying people that they kill. That's when slavery started. It just made more sense to have people work for free, right, instead of killing them, and then it becomes a health hazard because decaying people are, are kind, of, kind of out there. So it, it makes sense. So did it happen in Africa? Was uh, the New World the first uh, culture civilization to have slavery? Absolutely not. But in class, we can discuss the differences between slavery in Africa and other parts of the world and how it metamorphosized, how it changed to something very, very different in the new world. And that's something we can discuss. Okay? Th that's something that, you know, the data is there, you know, the reading is there, the materials are there, and we can look at the differences between the two. Capitalism. As Americans, we can't have any conversation without bringing up capitalism. <laughs> Because we talk about, you know, moral authority, right? You know, we put God on the money. So that, there goes that conversation right there. Okay, there is no separation of anything when you start out by putting God on the money. Okay. Christianity. Okay, so if the church now becomes involved and people come here for, quote unquote, religious freedom, Right? So what does it mean when we're talking about moral authority and we got the church involved, right? Nat Turner was a preacher. It gets more complicated, right? So, but it gets most complicated when we get into this paradox of freedom. And that's what, that's when my brain just went, <laughs> right? So here we go. Colonists, you know, they, they leave oppression. Okay, they come here. You got some colonies going on. And then you got the, you know, this big, bad, mean, imperialist state, right, saying, well, you're going to do things our way, right? So what do they say? They said in the 1700s, that's not fair. Taxation without representation, that's not fair. You guys are treating it. We, you know, we have a right. You know, we have these rights. We're going to take your tea, and we're going to, you know, we're going to throw them to the river, and we're going to stop traffic on the, you know, Funny, right? We're going to stop traffic in the bay. We're not going to let ships come in here. We're going to stop traffic and do take, take this, you know, hit you in the wallets economically. But yet at the same time that you have these colonists saying, we want free, we want free. The slaves are like, hmm, they want free. And they are articulating to this power, you know, the superpower of why they should be free. Can we latch on with you guys and get some of that free? That sounds like a great concept. You know, we too want some free. So now the paradox becomes, the mind-blowing reality becomes that we don't learn in our history classes is that you have slaves fighting with colonists and slaves fighting with England and everyone using the slaves to fight their battles and using them, promising them freedom, you know, to get what they want. So there is a history, okay, a history, hundreds of years, you know, since the 1700s, Africans fighting in wars. The Revolutionary War, fighting for freedom, right? And then we get to this point of enough is enough, and Nat Turner is characterized as this brutal, you know, this brutal, you know, how could you kill and slaughter? Well, the, the colonists, you know, I saw Mel Gibson, and he was doing some pretty wild stuff in that movie <laughs> with that tomahawk. I mean, that was some real kind of Nat Turner violence. Right? In The Patriot, right? 
But that was okay because it was for freedom. Right? So, and, and again, these ideas that are out there, and, and I'll just start giving you these items of, okay, slave trade, well, what fuels that? Okay, and here is a, a list of a lot of things, you know, you know, supplying arms. So now it becomes this, this cultural thing where, you know, Europeans begin to trick people, whoa, this is what you need, so it's business. It becomes about business, and whenever it becomes about business, you know, morality takes a step to the side. We can justify anything for money. We can justify anything if the price is right. And that's what all of these things are all about. The basis of enslavement. It was profitable. It was practical. It was justifiable in Eurocentric thought. Right? Which means that indentured servants, well, you just can't treat Christians any kind of way. But a slave, a slave is not a human. So you, they have a different code. You know? And if you are white and indentured servant, and you just kind of fade into the background and kind of go with the crowd, you know, it's a lot harder to find than, you know, the one black guy, you know, in, 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 in 17, 17. Yeah. Or the indigenous person who has been here, yeah. right? So these, it becomes practical and also justifiable, meaning that the indigenous servant can use the legal system, the slave cannot. So economically, so with slavery, shipbuilding, these towns, all of these beautiful towns that you see when you go to these coastal port areas, mm-hmm. built by slavery. Come on. Finance. Yes. The banking industry, boom. The shipping industry, boom. You know, built by this industry, textile, sugar. So not only could slaves, you know, they could be sold, they could be owned and rented. Let me get to here. And looking at this, the, the, the brutality of slavery, because this becomes important, because historically, as we begin to look at, well, what is significant about all of these uh, revolts happening? Because Nat Turner was the third, right? The third, you know, you have Denmark Vesey, you have Gabriel Prosser. But what a lot of people often forget is what kicked them all off was, and I'm going to go way ahead here. The Haitian Revolution. And the Haitian Revolution was inspired by what? 20 years before. The American Revolution. Okay. So you have the American Revolution, you have the French Revolution, the Haitian Revolution, and what happens during the Haitian Revolution, which is something that is, and they say, well, it's, 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 it's Haiti, what does that have to do with America? Okay. Well, Cuba is about 90 miles from Miami. Okay. I think Haiti may be about that or closer. So when the Haitian Revolution went down, South Carolinians lost their minds. Okay. And that's significant in this country because South Carolina, I'm pretty sure, is the only state in the history of this country that, had, that was like the Caribbean in which their slaves outnumbered okay, the number of you know, white citizens. And if you, you know, there are a lot of books, if you read about why slavery was so... Well, where slaves tend to outnumber the community, the owners, they have to be more brutal to maintain control over the slaves. Okay. So when the, the, when the train went off the tracks, you know, the train went off the rails, right, in Haiti, then South Carolina stepped things up. And from this, from the Haitian Revolution, okay, we have then the movement to Gabriel Prosser, Okay. And then from Prosser, we move to Denmark Vesey. Okay. And from Vesey, 
we get to Nat Turner. But I really wanted to just briefly show all this to also get to the discussion that revolt was just one very small piece of resistance. Okay. Every day, just the sheer act of not committing suicide was resistance in a world that is obviously set up to benefit right, the folks in which things were created for. So we get to continue the theme or to continue the motif of the system. Okay? The system is not, has not, I don't know if it can be broken. The system works for whom it was designed for. Okay? The system isn't for you, right? Never was. Okay? So we, the people, was wealthy white landowners. Who, you know, wealthy white male landowners. You know, heterosexual <laughs> landowners. <laughs> so the, it, cause it keeps getting smaller and smaller and tighter. Okay, that 1%. So when we talk about the founding fathers, we can't have that conversation because one of the wealthiest men in the history of this country was George Washington. About the only thing he owned more of than slaves may have been acres. Okay. So they probably named the state after him because that was probably all of his land. So then, you know, that, you know, isn't that worth fighting for? You know, isn't that worth fighting for? So when we talk about things like morality and these types of issues, it has been and always you know, arguably will be uh, about economics. Okay. And we have to understand that when we have these conversations about morality. Okay. Because, you know, morality is pretty simple. You know, we know right from wrong. We're born, I believe we're born with that innate sense of good versus evil. Okay. And we choose, right? We make choices, just like my students choose not to read. Okay, that's a choice. I don't make them not read. I don't hide the books. You know, I don't tape the books <laughs> shut. Right? They, they make a choice to do that because it's easy, because it's convenient. Okay? And at, cert at a certain point, historically, men and women made decisions, and they finally said no. And I'm willing to be uncomfortable because I'm going to sacrifice for something greater than myself. And that's hard. That's hard. Ask Montu, he'll tell you. It's hard to work all night and then get up and work some more. That's hard. That's why not everyone does it. Well, if it was easy, I'm sure everyone would do it. Okay. But again, I just wanted to give a taste of looking at a bigger picture, looking at kind of the economic and social history of why oppression is or became necessary. And it's very easy to tie it into greed. As Gordon Gekko said on Wall Street, greed is good. Greed is good. Okay. And unfortunately, there's not much more American than that. So thank you for letting me play in the cipher. All right, we're reaching the end, but I promise y'all, just bear with me. Bear with me. We don't got, I only got like one, we're almost there, all right? So just chill. We're going to make the library stay open late tonight. But anyways, <laughs> revolution? No, I'm just joking. I'm 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 joking. But, <laughs> no, but for real. Um, this next brother about to bring to the stage. Hey, I want y'all to know that that is, the dude that just got on the stage is Montu Miller's, like, mentor. Like, that's, the, that's who I look up to. That's my man. But anyways, just, and if you want his PowerPoint, anything you want here tonight, 
holler at one of us. We got an uh, email list on the back. We will get y'all some of this information. But I'm going to not waste any more time because I want to keep it rolling. I got, I, I ain't got to be like, just give me a minute. I promise y'all, I ain't got to be like, give me another 10, 12 minutes, okay? All right? This next young brother I'm about to bring to the stage, I have been through, I've been through highs with him, and we've been through some lows. We have, we have been on a roller coaster ride this last 15 years. We go high. It's me and him. I, we're, we're, it's, it's sort of like they say, like the, uh, the market is bulls and bears, right? Sometimes we're a bull and we are all out, boom, 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 boom. And sometimes we're a bear and we go hibernate because we got you. Because we've, we've done so much driving forward that we got to go, we got to go rest. We got to go be with our family. We got to go hibernate. So without further ado, y'all give it up one of my comrades, one of my great friends. He is an activist that just happens to be a rapper. Y'all give it up. And he don't come out much, so everybody in here is actually about to get a treat. Because he don't come out that much. Y'all give it up for my friend, my comrade, Issues. How y'all doing this evening? Good. All right, I'm going to try to keep this uh, this brief and to the point. I apologize. I haven't um, had a chance to prepare anything. Um, I'm very weary from travel. I've been driving since 5 o'clock yesterday. I literally touched down, unloaded the car, and, uh, and came here. So I've been, you know, for the last month I've been on the road, D.C., Maryland, New Jersey, New York, um, you know, just, just moving and organizing and, and, and kind of seeing the same things that exist in our community all over the country. So um, just forgive me if, if my energy level is real low, but I'm, I'm extremely tired. Uh, with that being said, um, we've heard some beautiful things up here today. And we talk about, we frame this whole thing about the, re the rebellion of Nat Turner. And we could talk about facts all day long. You know, we can go into specifics. You know, we can name dates. We can name what led to this and what led to that and all these different things. But I'm the type of person that Montu knows. He knows me. I'm, I'm blunt. You know, I'm blunt. I'm to the point. And if we get to the point, we get to the meat and potatoes of this thing, is what are we here for? We're here to talk about a person who decided enough is enough. A person who decided, and, and we can go through our history, and there's many of them. A person who decided enough is enough. And that person, once they made that decision, they realized, you know what? Even if this cost me my life, I got to do something. And this is, the, this is the point that we as a community have to get to. I, I frame my, my, my thing about the rebirth of our nation. Because our nation needs a rebirth. Our nation needs a rebirth. The most wealthiest person in human history came from us. In human history. The biggest kingdoms in human history belong to us. Here we are in 2016. And as rich as some people have gotten to, we don't own nothing. We don't own nothing. Even up in the, in the professional athlete level. How many owners? Zero. One. One. And we ain't even going to get into that. That owner. Okay? And how he got to where he got to. That's a whole nother discussion. But what are we doing? Where are we at? We need to recognize our strength. And we need to rebirth our nation. And you know where it starts? It starts with the brother, the brother said something that resonated with me. He said he decided to be uncomfortable. 
We got to get out. We got to become uncomfortable. We got we to gotta get out of this comfort zone we in. We got to, and you know what? The, the, I spoke before and I said that we need evolutionary thinking. And if evolutionary thinking leads to revolutionary thinking, then that's just the natural process. But before we can even get to revolution, we got to start thinking evolution. We got to start evolving our thinking. We got to start recognizing what can we do to change the conditions in our community. What can we do? Like you said, what can we do to make these corporations? What can we do? What can we do to get these people who have sucked so much from us through our history to give some of that back? Everyone talk about America, the great, America is the greatest country in the world. America is great, America is great. You know why America is great? America's great off the backs of black slaves. Let's just keep it real. That's just the truth. That's just the truth. That is what led, that is what God, and I can sit here all day and break down this man. Anyone who want to argue that with me, meet me outside. We became the greatest country on the planet off the backs of black slaves. That's just the truth. But through our history, you know what? Through our time, you know what we do? We stay away from the truth. We shy away from the truth because it makes us uncomfortable and it makes other people uncomfortable. You know what? I turned 40 last month. And I understand, and I understand once I turn 40, what a wise man said that you reach full maturity when you turn 40. And after I reach full maturity, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not shying away from the truth, not even for a second anymore. We can't take it. We can't survive it. Look at our numbers. Look at us in here. Okay? We need to start making some serious evolutionary changes. And you know where they start? They start with vices. Most of our vices, African American people, African people, most of our vices, it keeps this economy afloat. We spend the most money. Yes. We don't just buy cigarettes. We buy the most expensive cigarettes. And we buy them more often. We don't just buy clothes. We buy the most expensive clothes, even if we can't afford them. We buy J's. For what? For what? The same people that's getting us sick be feeding us medicine. And we buy it, and we buy it, and we need to stop. Cut your cable off. Cut your cable off. If you haven't already, cut your cable off. Okay, use that money for something else. Get together, think about, find some land. Okay, find some land. Start joining together and forming communities. It ain't gotta be a community with every black person you know. Get together with the people you know that are like-minded like you and form communities. You form a community, you form a community, you form a community, and then we barter and trade. Because guess what? When they shut Walmart down, what y'all gonna do? And it's coming. Listen, it's coming. It's coming. Believe it or not, it's coming. Exactly. So these are the things that we need to start thinking about. This is all well and good, and, and like I said, I want, to, I want to keep it as brief as possible. But these are the things that we need to start thinking about. This is all well and good, like they said. I've, you know how many of these I've been through, I've been to, I've spoke at, I've sat in the audience for? At some point, this has to turn into action. At some point. We can't sit up here and Nat Turner this, Nat Turner that. And then not go in like Nat Turner did. Everybody want to, you know, talk about Malcolm and Nat Turner and Martin Luther King. But very few people are willing to sacrifice what they're willing to sacrifice. Now, Haj Malik Shabazz said it best. The cost of freedom is death. That is what you have to resign your mind to. Even if this costs me my life. Forget my vice. Even if it costs me my life, okay?
we need to start educating ourselves, educating each other, educating our children, changing the narrative. We have accepted this narrative so long that anybody, anytime you say anything different, people will fight you over it. We just got finished talking about Nat Turner in the book. When I was young, Nat Turner was always one of my, my favorite uh, uh, historical uh, um, people through history. I used to, I remember being in school, in, in school textbooks, seeing pictures of Nat Turner with the nappy hair and everything they said about him. He, you know, he looked all savage and he killed a bunch of white people and all that kind of stuff. We need to start changing the narrative. We need to start changing the narrative that we're, we're, we're more prone to being criminals than anyone else on the planet. We need to start changing the narratives that we're unintelligent and we don't read. We need to start changing the narrative that we have to be on welfare and we have to do these things. We have to accept government assistance. We need to start changing the narrative. And these things start within ourselves. Listen, I'm not telling you nothing that I don't do myself. He knows. I walked away from a very lucrative career to do what? The most revolutionary thing that any person can do. Raise my family. Right now, my three oldest children speak three languages. Three. Okay? It has to start now. Okay? We've been accepting this for too long. All right? We've been accepting this for too long. African people. One of the most beautiful things that happened to me and me and this brother right here in the back, my brother, we went to Zimbabwe. One of the most beautiful countries I've ever been to. And I remember we was talking to one of the elders and, and I said something about being African-American and he said, no, you are not African-American. You are African. Hello. And I didn't understand that until I spent time there. And I said, wow, man, that dude right there remind me of my homeboy back home. Man, that dude right there remind me of my homeboy back home. Only difference is they speak a different dialect. Zimbabwe was one of the most beautiful countries that I've ever been to, you know why? Because Everyone knows about the history of, of Zimbabwe and Mugabe and what he did and brought everybody. There's a whole generation of people in, in Zimbabwe who had no idea what it's like to be a second class citizen. Black people who have no idea what it's even like to be a second class citizen. Not, okay, we were second class citizens and now we're fighting against that and now we're discovering our identity. No, they have no idea what that's like. I am beautiful. <laughs> I am absolutely beautiful. I went from there to South Africa, and because of the history of South Africa, seen a dis distinct difference. And I challenge everyone in here, African people here, go to Africa. Just go once. Okay? Again, change the narrative. Because I know a lot of people are thinking, a lot of people tell you, oh, they don't even like us over there. That's not true. That's not true. I've gone there. I've sat with the elders. I've learned the truth and the history that are not written in books, as she said. And this is what I come back with. So in closing, I just want to say, I love you all. Respect each other. Love each other. Educate each other. And let's grow. But thank you for coming out. And the one thing I want to leave y'all with is, when you leave here, don't just say, I came to an event. Tomorrow, have some boots on the ground and do something. Do something. Thank you.